Good morning, everyone. We've got groups joining us from all across Canada, the U.S., and excitingly, the U.S. Virgin Islands today as well. My name is Jesse, and welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are wrapping up the year. We've got our final, like, 25, 30 programs between now and mid-June, so thank you so much for joining us as you continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing explorers and scientists from around the globe. Now, I am very excited for today's program because we are diving in on one of our biggest series of topics in, in the world today, in the world this year. We've done over 500 programs since starting in September, and I can tell you that polar programs, programs highlighting the world's on on ice worlds in the north and south parts of our planet have been spectacularly well received and specifically those that deal with indigenous communities and so today we wanted to bring you David Borish who's going to tell us a little bit about his work working with the Inuit communities in Labrador and filming caribou one of the great migrations one of the great species here in North America his work has taken him all over the world Malaysia Nepal Peru Kenya and more but we today we're going to focus a little bit on our, our Canadian friends and I'm so excited to turn it over to David to blow your minds over the next 20 minutes. So without further ado, David, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, feel free to dive in. I'm excited to see your story and uh, get our kids all excited. All right. Great. Can you see my screen right now? Well, that's been up. Yeah, you're perfect. You're good to go, man. All right. Great. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you everyone for, for listening in. Uh, my name is David Borsch. I'm a filmmaker and a researcher from Southern Ontario. And over the past several years, I've been working with Inuit populations in Northern Canada on a project called HERD, Inuit Voices on Caribou. So I'm gonna dive into a little bit uh, around uh, how this project came to be, some of the context, what we're working on, and uh, also share a little bit of uh, the trailer for the film that we've been working on. So for a little bit of context, um, this is a map of Canada and most Canadians live within 100 kilometers of the U.S. border. So most people in Canada are on that lower part of Canada, including myself. But there's a whole other part of Canada called Inuit Nunangat. And that, that means the Inuit homelands within Canada. So uh, within Inuit Nunangat, there are uh, four different regions. There's Inuit from Inu uh, Nunavut. There's Inuit from Inuvialuit. Inuit from Nunavik, which is the northern part of Quebec. And then there's Inuit in Nunatsiavu, which is the northern part of Labrador, as well as a place called Nunatuvu, which is uh, doesn't have its land claims yet, but it's Inuit in uh, south and central Labrador. And so this is something that before I started doing work with Inuit, I, I didn't really know anything about Inuit homelands. Um, but uh, the work that I've been doing has been with Inuit within Labrador. So those last two places there, the Nunatsiavut region and the Nunatuvut region within Labrador, Canada. And this is a pretty interesting place because Inuit in Labrador have shared a deep and enduring relationship with caribou. Now caribou, uh, as many of you uh, might have thought about over Christmas holidays and stuff, caribou are actually just like reindeer. They're kind of like this deer species that lives in northern, um, really the northern part of the world, the circumpolar part of the world. They live across Canada, uh, Alaska, Russia, Scandinavia. And in Labrador, Inuit have shared a really important relationship with this animal for many generations. Caribou are considered a really important part of Inuit food security, uh, culture, uh, emotional well-being. Uh, the way that they can connect with their land and their places. So this animal is a really important part of Inuit lives. And in Labrador, the George River caribou herd, which is one of the main herds there, was once numbered to be somewhere around 800,000 animals back in the 90s. So at the time, back in the 90s, it was one of the biggest caribou herds in the entire world. 800,000, that's a lot of caribou. They were just all over the place. However, since then, the George River caribou herd has been on a steady and rapid decline. It's estimated that since the 90s, the George River herd has declined by over 99%, meaning that this herd is somewhere now below 10,000 animals. So just a huge, huge decline in a very short amount of time. And no one really understands the reasons why the caribou herds have declined to the extent that they have. Uh, but there are a variety of different ideas and, and theories. And 
Uh, some of those are related to natural factors. Caribou populations over large periods of time go up and down in population. Um, so this same herd back several decades ago was actually very low, and then it shot right back up to a massive number and then right back down to what it is today. But now there's all these factors like climate change, human developments, and other factors where people just don't know, are they going to rebound? Are they going to continue to decline? No one's really sure. But it's within this context that this caribou population decline that the government of Newfoundland and Labrador enacted a total hunting ban on the George River herd, meaning that no one, not even indigenous peoples like Inuit, are legally allowed to hunt or interact with this animal as they have for decades. And this hunting ban was enacted in 2013. So it's almost been 10 years that Inuit have not been able to hunt this animal that is a really important part of their lives. And within this context of this hunting ban and these caribou declines, Inuit across Labrador shared this, uh, this, this understanding that there needed to be a way of hearing Inuit voices, hearing Inuit knowledge and experiences with this ecological crisis. Um, they need to hear on, you know, what are people feeling? What are people experiencing when they can't interact with this animal that is a really important part of their lives? And so that led into this broader project that I was involved in um, called Herd Inuit Voices on Caribou. And it's all about amplifying Inuit voices. And we're trying to do that through characterizing the changing caribou populations on Inuit health and well-being and doing so all through creating documentary film with Inuit participants. So the idea here was both to work on a research project, to listen in and hear Inuit perspectives, but also share these experiences through film. So I, I had a, an incredible opportunity to travel with my colleague, Ina Shywak, who's uh, an Inuit woman from Rigolet, and we traveled all across Labrador to 11 different communities. And the idea was uh, to talk to a wide range of people through uh, in-depth filmed interviews. And so we, we actually talked to over 80 people across these 11 communities. Uh, and for a bit of context on these communities, there's very few roads in Labrador. So to get to them, a lot of the time we had to fly in or even skidoo to get to these communities. Um, and the idea also was not just to talk to one specific type of group of people, but talk to a range of different people. So we talked to women, we talked to men, we talked to youth and elders and, and hunters and cooks to get a variety of experiences on how are these caribou changes affecting you. And as mentioned, the whole approach of what we were doing was using film to document people's uh, perspectives, the landscapes, and caribou. And it was also part of a collaboration approach. So I, I worked with uh, a variety of Inuit knowledge holders, uh, such as in this photo, I worked with uh, a guy named uh, Eldred Allen, who's uh, an Inuk man from Rigolet, uh, as well as he Henry Lyle, uh, an Inuit knowledge holder from Nain, Nunatsiavut, Labrador. Uh, and together we went out and uh, tracked caribou uh, we went and filmed them all for this larger documentary film project. And so it's through this experience of uh, talking with Inuit uh, and hearing their perspectives that we learned a variety of Inuit experiences with these declines. And so that's something that I, I want to show you. And one of the first ways that people talked about these experiences with caribou declines was that caribou was a really important source of food. The caribou meat was, I suppose you would call it the stable. We had that every day, you know, almost always every day, caribou meat. So people talked about eating caribou almost every day. It was considered a staple food. A staple, staple food is something that is just a really, really important part of a community's diet. And so the way that, you know, I, I might eat a lot of bread or pasta or whatever it might be, um, for Inuit in Labrador, uh, caribou was really that source of food. Uh, they ate it all the time. In some, in some cases, people talked about eating caribou five or six days a week. 
Uh, and part of this is because um, caribou was just a big animal. It was a lot of meat that you could share out to different people. And food in the north is pretty expensive. So not everyone can go to the grocery store and buy groceries like I can in, in southern Canada. Um, so caribou was really that kind of like a, a main source of food. But it wasn't just the quantity that people ate. It was also the fact that caribou was a really healthy source of food. It was culturally appropriate and it was diverse. Uh, the number of times I've talked to people where they just had so many different ways of eating caribou, uh, whether it was um, through steaks or a roast or in soups. People had it on pizzas. They had it in spaghetti. They had it raw. They had it in so many different ways. They truly just loved eating caribou. But it wasn't just that caribou was an important source of food as to why they were important for Inuit. They're also very important for cultural purposes. Do the Inuit culture is important because they're, they're a part of the land and being living out here like this on this land like this, not too far from here, to share the land with the humans out here and people. You know, it's part of their lifestyle with the caribou in their life. So people talked about how caribou was a really important part of their lifestyle. This animal was totally connected to cultural practices, uh, traditions, and, and knowledge being passed down from one generation to the next. It allowed people to, to go out and engage in cultural experiences with, uh, with their grandparents or, or their parents. It was really an important part of community culture. And it was also an important way of connecting people to the land. Inuit have a really, really uh, deep connection to their homelands. Uh, they spend a lot of time out on the land. They know the land, the ice, the waters extremely well. And caribou was a really important part of their connections to land because to go on a caribou hunt, you didn't just go in your backyard and hunt a caribou. You went for days at a time across different rains, different landscapes across Labrador, just to go hunt caribou. So people learned a lot about their land, their homelands. They learned about place names, uh, different names, uh, Inuit names for, for their locations. So caribou was just a really important part of their connections to land, their culture, and their connections to each other. But now that the caribou populations have been declining and that there's been this hunting ban, there's been a lot of influences on Inuit culture, food, and as well on Inuit identity. I miss the hunt. I miss the meat. I miss the, everything about it. It's, like I said, a big, big part of who we are, our identity is taking away like so many other things that we have no control over. A lot of people talked about how uh, important caribou was for their culture, but also for their identity, the way that they see themselves. A lot of these people, they, they said caribou is a part of who we are, but now that there's no more caribou, what does that mean for them? And so there were a lot of discussions around ways that the caribou declines were affecting their own identity, the way that they saw themselves. Um, and this wasn't just on uh, an individual level, but also as a collective level, because caribou was an important part of their communities, their heritage, their history, their culture. And when you take that away, what, what does that mean for, for the people that rely on that? And one of the, the interesting um, comparisons I heard was that what one woman told me for, for people that aren't Inuit, that don't know anything about caribou, it's hard for them to understand this, but think about it as if Thanksgiving or Christmas was taken away from you. And to me, the, I, you know, I, I don't have a deep connection to caribou, but I can't imagine not having Christmas with my family or Thanksgiving with my family. That's the way that these people feel is that caribou and the caribou experience and bringing people together was just a really important source of, of culture and family connections and food. And now that that's taken away, what does that mean for them? So all to say that we talked to a variety of different people that had so many different perspectives. The, sh the ones that I shared there were just, just a few. Um, and we talked to people young and old, 
uh, some who had never even seen a caribou before and others who had lived their entire life with caribou. And the whole purpose of this was to show that as there's changes in an animal or a species or climate change, there's going to be really big effects on the animals, but there's also really big effects on people that rely on those animals. So as there's more and more change happening around our world, as there's uh, biodiversity loss, as there's animals declining, we have to think about it not just as conservation issues or environmental issues, but also as issues that are really important for certain people and communities and individuals that live alongside those animals and those landscapes. So as mentioned, uh, this project was all about research, but it was also about creating a film. And the film isn't released yet. It's going to be released later this year, but we do have a trailer to show you. So I hope you're ready for a little sneak peek into the film that we're putting together. The hillsides, you've just seen everything moving with caribou. They were so numerous. I mean, it's like wildebeest in, in Africa. It's something that us Inuit love and thrive on. I suppose you would call it the staple. We had that every day. We dried it, we celebrated it, we shared it. It was a part of who we were. And then after a while, it sort of, you could almost feel more observed that there were a little fewer. But who, who would ever think that our main source of food would disappear? There's more bad news tonight about our vanishing caribou population. There will last me on even placing the caribou. The loss of a food, a, a cultural food, is just as high of an importance as language, craft, and art. Having a caribou hunt is one of the proudest things that a young man can say is that they shot the first caribou. And now my generation don't have that option. A big, big part of who we are, our identity is taking so many other things. It was almost like the caribou was the reason and everything else happened after. So that's the end of my presentation, but I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a sense of uh, how important this animal is to, to people uh, in, in Labrador, Inuit in Labrador, uh, that what this decline means, not only for the animals, but also for these communities, and that a lot of these issues are, are very complex. And so hopefully it gave you a little idea, and I'm looking forward to sharing the film with you at a later point as well. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. Well, what a great trailer. And again, I'll put this up on the screen, make sure it lives online for anyone who's going to watch this later, but herdfilm.ca, I'm certainly excited to see it. Um, and so uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that, being willing to in today's broadcast. That means a lot, David. Yeah, uh, thanks. So and sorry, I, we actually changed our domain, so I can put that in the chat oh, right thank now. thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All, all good. That, that's that's my bad. So it's actually inuitvoicesherd.com. Hopefully everyone can, right. can see that. Yes, that's in, that's in our chat, and I'll just bring it up as a banner for our folks that are joining on YouTube today as well. We'll make sure all our registered classes have those at the end as well. So can you at voiceheard.com and I think that's a, a beautiful thing. For, <laughs> for sure. Um, let's dive in with questions. We've got our three live groups. We've got a bunch of groups on YouTube. If you are on YouTube and you want to share questions in the chat, please do and I'll pass along as many as we can over the next 20 minutes. But I want to head to Miss Heather's class to kick us off with a question. Uh, joining us today in Whitney. If you guys want to come on in, you're unmuted. You're good to go. Take us away. Hi, everybody says hi for my class. They're just virtual, but they're waving. I can see them waving at you. <laughs> All um, right, hi everyone. <laughs> um, a question we had is, what is your favorite part of traveling to these remote locations? And what is your least favorite part of traveling to them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say my favorite part is definitely meeting all of the incredible people in these communities. The, these are, are very, um, they're, they're communities that don't have a lot of urban access. You know, a lot of the time they're you know, just a few hundred people. But I had such an honor and privilege to interact with some of the most incredible people that I've ever met and learn from their experiences and the knowledge that they have of their homeland is just incredible. So that was probably my favorite part. 
And least favorite, I, I don't know if I have a least favorite. It's It gets tiring after a little while, but to be honest, it, it's just a great time being up there. You, you certainly exude that, that there is no least favorite part. And I think a lot of filmmakers and explorers and people like you would, would echo that sentiment. David, I'm curious, this is a question we don't often get, but I think it's really important for our classes to know. How do you choose who to talk to? When you get to one of these communities, how do you go about that process of finding the people to interview uh, to begin with? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so that is totally not up to me. You know, when I go into these communities, I, I'm a visitor. I, I'm not from there. I don't have these deep connections. I don't have that understanding. So I, uh, it totally is reliant on our strong partnerships and collaborations that we have with our Inuit partners. So some of our Inuit partners, including our community uh, kind of researcher, co-collaborator, uh, co her name's Ina Shywak. She was the one that was making all these uh, connections and she knows the people that are important to talk to, as well as our other uh, Inuit partners, uh, the Nunatiabu government and the Nunatubu Community Council. They shared a list of people that they thought would be good for this film. And so I, it's not like I was going in and saying, hey, like, let's just pick <laughs> random people. It was yeah. through our partners. Yeah. And I think that sort of indigenous led approach is something that we're starting to see more and more with films like this and programs like this. And I think that's so, so important is it's sort of direct contrast to how it used to be done where you people did just go in and do things and take things. And I think that that's a, a exactly. Really yeah. Um, F7A, if you guys want to come on in and share a question, we'll come to you first. Miss Claus will come to you guys next in a second. Uh, but our F7A crew, welcome in. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hey, F7A. How you guys doing? <laughs> A question for us? Do we have a question? If you have a question, you can go up to the mic. You have a question? Anyone with a question? No question. On the spot. Okay, we'll come back in a minute. No worries, guys. <laughs> Think it through. Let's head to our Antilles School friends joining us in Miss Clausen's group in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, welcome in. Hey. Hello. We have a couple of questions. We're going to start with Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Perfect. Hey, Sean. Hi. What made you want to start? What made you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've always been interested in different environmental issues. I've been interested in animals. I've been interested in social issues too. And so when I heard about this opportunity, it just it seemed like a really great chance to tell an important story that hadn't been told yet. Uh, and also, I have a lot of interest in film and photography and visual media. And so it kind of just brought all my interests together uh, through this really important issue. But yeah, I, when I was growing up, when I was when I was a lot of your ages, I, I really wanted to work for National Geographic. I loved reading National Geographic magazines and just going to the zoo and interacting with different social issues. So that's some of the reasons why I wanted to get into this. I wanted to work for National Geographic too, David. We'll get there together. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, Ms. Heather's class, come on in if you guys want to take us away with another question. You're all good. Sure. Um, I actually, oh, sorry, I'm muted for my class. Hang on. Okay, there we go. They want to hear the questions too. Um, I have questions about caribou specifically. I don't know how much you know about the caribou, but I mm -hmm. have questions about um, how fast do they run? How long do they live? Just kind of like wanting to understand more about a caribou itself. Yeah, sure. So I'll say that I'm not a caribou expert, but I interacted with a lot of caribou experts um, over the years. Um, I don't know the exact uh, you know, uh, quantifiable number on how fast they can run, but they're very fast. They're kind of like the the horses of the north. Um, so that that's one of the reasons why it, it can be sometimes challenging for, you know, wolves to track them down and everything. So they are very fast runners. Um, they can live fairly long. I, I don't know the exact number, but they it's not like they just live for a few years. I think it's probably similar to to a cow or, or a horse. Um, but some, some of the kind of... Uh, fun facts that I learned over the years is that uh, caribou are, uh, they're, they're built for the north, they're built for, you know, the snow and all that, but they're actually really good swimmers. Uh, they're considered to be some of the best swimmers in the ungulate family, which means animals typically with, with hooves. Um, and part of that's because their fur is actually hollow, like their hairs are hollow, um, which helps with insulation for warmth, but also with buoyancy, it keeps them afloat while they're, while they're swimming. And caribou are, you know, in some cases used to swimming quite far distances to get to different parts of, of the landscape. So, um, yeah, and they also, uh, both males and females grow horns, or sorry, not horns, antlers, <laughs> a big difference between antlers and horns. Um, and during the winter wintertime, uh, the female caribou have the antlers. 
So whenever you hear about reindeer and Santa's reindeer and, you know, all these different male names, they're actually all females because typically during the winter time around Christmas, all the males don't have their antlers. So just right. some fun facts. I love that fact. That's fantastic. I'm so glad we get that. Every time we talk about caribou, that get brought, gets brought up somewhere along the line. And for our students, I did put this in the private chat as well, but if you're on YouTube, this wildly unwieldy URL that's giant and takes up the whole screen, if you want to find out from National Geographic some more facts about caribou, a really great resource uh, is right there if you want to keep the learning going. Uh, F7A, we're going to come back, see if you have a question now, and then we'll go to Ms. Closet's class with like kids lined up, which is a good problem to have. Yeah. Computer is about to die. If, if it dies, I'll, I'll join back. Okay, sorry. Let me just plug oh, it in. No worries. Plug it in. I'll come back in a sec. Ms. Closet's group, come on back in. There you go. Hey. Um, my question was, how long have you guys been doing this business or yeah. like what? Yeah, yeah. So we we've been uh, working on this project since about 2016. So I, I so when the the ban was enacted on Caribou in 2013, Inuit across Labrador were saying we need to create a documentary film about this story. Uh, and I only got involved in the project as a filmmaker in 2016. So it, it's really been over the course of five, six years to put all this together in a way that also aligns with Inuit values. Yeah. That's, uh, I was going to ask, one of the questions we always get is what's next for you? And I guess this is a story that's going to continue on for you. Like, this is a big deal. You're releasing this film. When are you releasing the film? And, and when, where are you set to release it? Is it just going to be online, film festivals? Where can we find yeah. it? Yeah, so we've got three different uh, cuts of the film. We've got an hour-long film. We've got a 44-minute film that's going to be shown on, uh, for broadcast on TV, um, yes. including in Canada later this year. Uh, and we also short film that's about 15 minutes that it's going to be for film festivals uh, so we've got a variety of different cuts uh that we're hoping to release by by the fall essentially uh and a, a really important part of what we're working on right now is we're trying to develop curriculum educational resources for teachers all about this work so if you know if you have a chance to visit our website you can see there's lots of multimedia there's lots of quotes there's there's research there's photos and we're going to try to develop some actual curriculum so that your kind of classes can actually go through this and learn and have discussions about what it means from an environmental lens or a social science lens or a history lens or whatever it might be. So those are some of the things we're working on. That is very cool. David, you should reach out to Joe and I at the end of this program. We could talk about Canadian Geographic, Polar Knowledge Canada, some other places that I think would absolutely love to partner on this because it's such a special and, and fantastic story. For very sure. Cool. Awesome, man. Uh, F7A, you're plugged in. Nothing went wrong. Do you have any questions for us now? Come back in. Yeah, Emily had a question. Have you ever gone like really close to like a big part of them or like do you just stay from afar? Yeah, yeah I did. Actually, let me see if I can quickly share my screen again. I, I might be able to show you something kind of cool. Okay. Uh, okay. The anticipation's building. I'm very excited. Well, they are well, quite, well, quite an incredible herd, and I, I always I didn't emphasize that in the beginning very well. But like when people think about these grand herds of wildlife, they think about East Africa, and so few people, even Canadians, mm -hmm. think about that. And it's incredible the scale of, of this. So yeah, we got your screen share up. You got the okay, right. okay, okay, great. So uh, this is actually this is the first day I ever saw caribou, and we oh. had taken the helicopter out. Um, far out in, into the past the tree line, and we, we came across uh, this small group of caribou, uh, like a few hundred, which is considered small now. Um, but this is uh, this is me down here taking the shot, and that mm -hmm. shot that I'm taking is the shot uh, up here on the top. So, I would say deer in the headlights, but no headlights. Deer in the <laughs> frame. <laughs> but yeah, you, it was such an incredible experience. This is about as close as I got to caribou. Actually, I did get a little bit closer to one, but uh, they're just, they're such uh, magical animals um, to just be living past the tree line, out onto the tundra. Um, really just, yeah, be beautiful, beautiful creatures. And I was incredibly privileged to interact with them. Yeah, how neat is that? What fun. Um, Ms. Heather's class, we'll come back to you guys if you have another question. Uh, come on in. I think we have one more. Um, 
Perfect. The cla my class is just wondering, we all live in Toronto, but mm -hmm. what, what can we do to help or to understand better, obviously, other than watching your amazing documentary when it comes out? Uh, but we just want to know what else we can do to become better educated and support these people that are having a hard time with what's happening. Yeah, it, it, that's a really good question because uh, I, I think a lot of people, uh, including myself before this project, we, we, we wanted to learn more and find out how we can help. And I think the, the one of the biggest things you can do from our work is try to learn more about the social and health dimensions of environmental change. Um, because right now it's not like we, we have a GoFundMe page or anything like that where you can send money to these communities. But what these communities want from this work and from this film is just for people to understand that there's a lot of change happening with climate change, environmental change, but there's also a lot of effects on their communities. And they want people to know that so that uh, hopefully down the road when decisions are made, when policy is made, that it's considering their voices, not just considering, it should be Inuit-led strategies for their communities. And so anything you can do to, to learn more about these communities themselves, about their culture, about their relationships with the land and the importance of their leadership in conservation, that's something that I think they really would support. Yeah. And I'm happy to connect at a later time as well to share more resources that might help with that. We'd absolutely love that. And this has been one of our big themes all year long. In fact, we've got a few more programs on this approach going forward in the next coming weeks. Uh, bison and the story of bison and how integral they are to communities across central Canada has been a really big theme of our program this year. We haven't had the chance to talk about caribou yet, but that's an essential piece to all this. And I think uh, in, on Oceans Week, the Oceans Week Canada series, you've got two-eyed seeing sort of indigenous-led conservation out of the West Coast for salmon as well. So this is something that we're, we're really trying to emphasize in our programs that Exploring by the City of your Pants. And I'm really glad you asked that question, Ms. Heather, because it's so important as Canadians. I, I, I mean, David, correct me if I'm wrong. When we grew up, this was not something that we were taught. Like, this is not when we did Indigenous stories. We went to you know one place, one time a year. We spent an hour. We left, and that was the entirety of our curriculum. And that's changed so radically over the last five years. But it still really behooves all of us to take the time to learn about these things and how impactful something like a blanket ban on a many thousand year cultural practice is to a community. And that's where your film does such a great job of highlighting that. So totally. And I, just to build on that, I, I think that, uh, you know, all, all of you listening in today, uh, you're growing up in an, in an exciting time in many ways, because yeah, it, it's not like I was in school that long ago, but the way that we learned about indigenous peoples or their connections to the land was, was very narrow minded. But now I think you're, you're getting an opportunity to see that there's different ways that people can think about the world, think about their connections to land, think about animals and their communities. And it's not just with indigenous peoples, people yeah. all over the world have different perspectives on, on nature. And so having an insight into these diverse perspectives, even if you're not from those places, is really helpful. And, you know, I'm, I'm in Toronto right now as well. So I feel yeah. very far away from, you know, caribou in the north. But still trying to find ways of learning more about these places is really important. Yep. Thank you so much for all that, David. Um, time flies and you're having fun, so we're going to take a couple more questions before we wrap up together and make sure you guys have those links to keep the learning going. Uh, F7A, I'm going to come to you guys first if you have a second question, and Ms. Plaza will wrap up with you guys in just a second. Uh, our 7A group, any other questions? Uh, we don't have any more, I don't think. No, I think we're good. Thank you. No worries. Well, thank you so much for joining today. Ms. Fawzan, do you want to wrap us up at the Antilles School? Go for it. Um, do you work for National Geographic or no? <laughs> um, I have worked for a branch of National Geographic. I, it's not like I'm fully employed by them. That's, that's still my dream. Um, but I, I've worked uh, in Alaska on, on a project um, about leading youth. Uh, to learn more about uh, nature in, in Alaska. And I also worked in Iceland uh, leading a youth trip uh, to learn about uh, conservation there. Uh, so I've, I've worked with National Geographic, but I don't work for National Geographic. We'll just keep doing programs like this till they can't say no, I think is our goal. David, exactly. uh, you're a very cool guy. I, I want to address for our classes, if you want to learn more about the film, some of that amazing educational resource backdrop uh, that David talked about, InuitVoicesHeard.com is your one-stop shop for that. Some amazing stuff there and if you want to check out more of david's work i found his uh, amazing website online i know we talked about the inuit story in labrador today but davidforestvisuals.com you've got some incredible photography and, and stuff there um you're a very very talented guy <laughs> so for our class, thank you 
Thank you. Um, so nice to have you here today, David. And uh, as Joe may have mentioned, what we do to wrap up every program, I'm going to bring in our class and say a big thank you and farewell. So F7A, Miss Heather's class, Miss Pawson's group, if you guys want to unmute your mics and say a big thank you and goodbye, you are all in the broadcast. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.